Hey everybody, I'm Dom, and this is Domination. And welcome to a part of the show that I like to call Story View, where I take a video game and only review one aspect of it, the story. I may touch upon other elements of the game in this video as well, but I'm mainly focusing on story for this. And for the first story view, I'm taking a look at a game which some people consider to be an underrated gem. And that game is Dragon's Dogma. In fact, I'm sort of surprised not many people have heard of this game. On the outside, it has everything going for it. A game made by AAA developer Capcom with a high fantasy setting like Elder Scrolls, the climbing mechanic of Shadow of the Colossus, the difficulty spikes resembling Dark Souls, a fast-paced combat system like Devil May Cry, and the fact that you get to create not just your main character but your main companion as well? Dude, count me in! But again, as I said, that's on the outside. On the inside, the game does in fact have a lot of flaws, some of which pertain to the story. But despite all these flaws, is the story of Dragon's Dogma a highlight of the game, or is it one of those games where story doesn't really matter and it's all about the gameplay anyway? Well, let's find out. This is Story View of Dragon's Dogma. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest. On my first playthrough of Dragon's Dogma, I felt the story left much to be desired. Which was a shame, because I thought the premise of this game's story was pretty darn cool. But when it took the turns it did, I was incredibly disappointed. But when I played it again, I noticed a deeper detail which actually made me think the story was genius. So what is the story? Well, I'll tell you, if you don't mind spoilers. If you do, you clicked on the wrong video. And because I'm a nice guy, I'm giving you the chance to leave right now. If you haven't played the game and want to, and you care about spoilers, leave. If you've played the game, don't don't want to play the game, or just don't really care about spoilers, by all means, stay. Are we good? Good. Now let's continue. So the story starts out with you living a day of your kind of average, boring life in the village of Cassardus, which is located in the Kingdom of Grancis. But all of a sudden, a big scary dragon, simply known as... The dragon appears and wrecks havoc on the village. Now for those of you who know this game by heart, yes, I know his name is actually Grigori, but the game only bothers to call him that twice while everybody calls him the dragon. The credits of the game just call him the dragon. And in the Capcom en uh, um, encyclopedia, his, ca his page is called the dragon. So guess what? I'm just going to call him the dragon. So anyway, you, a humble fisher person, sees the havoc, spots the beast, picks up an old rusty sword, and goes to fight it. Hmm, a humble villager with little to no battle experience armed with a rusty blade going up against a monster who's existed for thousands of generations who has fiery breath is incredibly powerful both physically and magically with impenetrable skin? Gee, I wonder who's gonna win! <laughs> So after that humiliating defeat, the dragon decides to humiliate you even further by ripping your heart out and eating it. Right in front of you! <laughs> However, unlike a normal person, you don't actually die. You instead become the Arisen, whose sole purpose is to slay the dragon, and that's kinda it. Well, if anything, it at least provides different motivation to the whole slay the dragon trope. Eh. That's cool. So then, after setting out with a mysterious being called a pawn, you come across a place simply known as the encampment. While there, you get to create your main pawn and everything seems all hunky-dory. But then a hydra attacks the encampment, however you and your pawns take care of it by chopping off its head. <sighs> okay, Greek mythology lesson 101, okay? When you cut off a hydra's head, you don't actually solve the problem. If anything, you make it a lot worse because, in fact, two heads grow back instead of just one. Seriously, everybody knows this. Even Captain America knows this. You're slacking, Capcom. You're slacking. So after cutting off the head, you escort the Enlistment Corps soldiers with the Hydra head to Grand Soren, capital of Grancis. For most people, this is where the plot starts to go downhill. 
You then become the loyal servant of Duke Edmund Dragonsbane, and you carry out every single one of the Duke's missions. These missions include, but are not limited to, having encounters with a group of loony bins known as Salvation, killing giant monsters, finding hermits in very remote locations, killing giant monsters, infiltrating fortresses, and still killing giant monsters. After many hours of gameplay being the Duke's lapdog, the dragon finally shows himself and interrupts the character known as the Elysian while in the middle of yet another encounter with Salvation. And quite hilariously, too, I might add. Demons! This is absolute truth! Just fantastic. It's like the dragon just got bored of you getting sidetracked and came in and said, Hey, did you forget about me? Seriously, the game's called Dragon's Dogma, not this guy's dogma. Heck, I don't even know what a dogma is, but whatever it is, it's mine, dang it! So after the dragon tells you to get moving already, you and your pawns go to the Tainted Mountain to have the final showdown. Here, the dragon tells you to either sacrifice your loved one to him and become the new duke, which is how Edmund got to be duke in the first place, or fight him and kill him and gain satisfaction as well as the possibility of you, Jr. And canonically speaking, you're supposed to fight him. So then after fighting him and saving your love interest, you live happily ever after and the game ends. Not! No, it seems that because the dragon's gone, the sky is raining ashes, stronger monsters come out of hell, half of Grand Soren has collapsed and fallen through the earth, and Duke Edmund is a frail old man. He decides to brand you a traitor, forcing you to get chased through the city and get knocked into the Everfall, the source of all the monsters. So the moral of the story, kids, is that if there's a big scary dragon terrorizing the world, don't kill it. You're just going to make the situation worse. But not only is the Everfall the source of monsters, it's the source of all life. As it turns out, throwing 20 wake stones into the Everfall actually opens up a portal to heaven where you meet the previous Arisen who had successfully completed the whole quest. I, I should probably mention that wake stones are basically like the resurrection stone from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, but a lot cooler. Upon completing his quest, the previous Arisen, now known as the Seneschal, took over as God of the World. When you meet him, he basically says, Hey buddy, guess what? It's your turn to be god of this world. But first you gotta kill yourself so that your main companion can live. Which is exactly what happens. But while your spirit stays as god of the world, your main pawn spirit inhabits your body and steals your significant other. Doosh. So that's the story of the game. At first, I thought the story was a bore, with its pacing starting out as nice and fast, then dropping significantly slow throughout the entire middle portion, to out of nowhere going back to fast, almost as if to say, come on, finish up the darn story already! But then I found one little detail, and it changed my perspective of the game's story drastically. I then thought that it was a brilliant way of showing this story. Basically, it's that the entire middle portion is how the Duke is trying to kill you so that you won't go confront the dragon. I won't go into it now, as that could take up a video on its own, but it's still a really cool detail. However, without it, the story is very slow and kinda choppy at parts. And in the middle, no part of the story was interesting. It was just some guy saying, Do this or we're all gonna die! Or do that or salvation will take over! Or if you don't do this, the children will chase you with butterfly nets! Who cares?! Also, not only was the story boring, the characters were mostly boring, too. A lot of them sounded the same, with the total amount of diversity being three French people and the rest are all Brits. Which would be fine if the character traits were more diversified. Sadly, they aren't. They were almost all selfish and lazy, and I didn't give a darn about a good majority of them. That is, again, except for the Duke. Again, without going into too much detail about what I had said before, this character is a very complex and mysterious character with a backstory that, when revealed to me, made me want to know a lot more about him. Also, Lady Eleanor was nice. Hmm, maybe that's why I wanted her to be my love interest in this game. Hmm, funny how that happens. The rest of them, though, stupid. However, I found the coolest parts of the story were just the moments and setups I found myself in. 
Some of these setups were pulled straight out of my imagination, like infiltrating a forsaken tower or leading a charge against an army of goblins that for some reason reminds me of Helm's Deep, or rescuing Eleanor from execution by fighting off the guards and escaping through the sewers, just like in A Link to the Past. As far as the other moments, there were happy moments like meeting Eleanor, sad moments like the ending, and then there were just WTF moments like the quest arousing suspicion. Seriously, this scene is so weird that even my character's reaction just screams WTF. And speaking of that ending, that ending was a really cool ending. It actually made me question whether or not the slaying the dragon was actually the right thing to do. Some people might be pissed off, but I liked it. It was again another way to mess with the trope slaying the dragon. Also, the part where the previous Arisen is handing the torch over to the current one was actually kind of a thought-provoking segment. It kind of showed that the ultimate goal was the uh oh the game was to become god of the world, but simultaneously it asked the question, is that really all it's cracked up to be? We see this because the Seneschal is actually asking you to, uh, uh, to free him from his servitude as the Seneschal so that you can take over. And I gotta say, that's a really powerful question to ask in a video game. Yeah, there have been movies and books that have asked this question too, one of my favorite examples being Bruce Almighty, but it's more powerful to ask that question in a video game, and that's because playing God is what separates a video game from something like a book or a movie. It's the whole purpose of it. Controlling a character or army or whatever it is in the game, and having them do what you want how you want them to do it. So for a video game to ask the question, is being God really worth it, while also acknowledging that the whole purpose of its entire medium was a very thought-provoking thing. So overall, I really do like the story. Sure, the pacing isn't the best and most of the characters kind of suck, but the rest of the stuff is just too good. If you're looking for a grand and epic story to experience in a game, you might want to go try something else like either Uncharted, The Last of Us, or heck, even a Zelda title. But if you're looking for some decent fantasy lore with a good concept and a thought-provoking final act, check it out. You might be pleasantly surprised. And that ends today's video. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any video ideas of something that you want to see me do in the future, comment below to let me know. Make sure to like the video if you liked it, favorite it if you loved it, and subscribe to Domination if you want more of it. Once again, I'm Dom, and this was Domination. See you guys next time.